Immediately, the counselors, keeping a lookout with Hrothgar, watching the lake water, saw a heave up and surge of water and blood in the backwash. They bowed gray heads, spoke in their sage, experienced way about the good warrior, how they never again expected to see that prince returning in triumph to their king. It was clear to many that the wolf of the deep had destroyed him forever. The nine hour of the day arrived, the brave shieldings abandoned the cliff top, and the king went home, but sick at heart, staring at the mere, the strangers held on, they wished, without hope, to behold their lord, Beowulf himself. Meanwhile, the sword began to wilt into gory icicles, to slather and thaw. It was a wonderful thing, the way it all melted as ice melts, when the father eases the fetters off the frost and unravels the water ropes. He who wields power over time and tide, he is the true lord. The Geat captain saw treasures in abundance, but carried no spoils from those quarters except for the head and the inlaid hilt embossed with jewels. Its blade had melted, and the scrollwork on it burnt, so scalding was the blood of the poisonous fiend who had perished there. Then away he swam, the one who had survived the fall of his enemies, flailing to the surface, the wide water, the waves and pools were no longer infested once the wandering fiend let go of her life in this unreliable world. The seafarer's leader made for land, resolutely swimming, delighted with his prize, the mighty load he was lugging to the surface, his thanes advanced in a troop to meet him, thanking God and taking great delight in seeing their prince back safe and sound. Quickly the hero's helmet and mail shirt were loosed and unlaced, the lake settled, clouds darkened above the blood-shot depths. With high hearts they headed away, along footpaths and trails to the fields, roads that they knew, each of them wrestling with the head they were carrying from the lakeside cliff, men kingly in their courage and capable of difficult work. It was a task of four to hoist Grendel's head on a spear and bear it under strain to the bright hall, but soon enough they neared the place, fourteen geats in fine fettle striding across the outlying ground in a delighted throng around their leader in he came then the thane's commander the arch warrior to address hrothgar his courage was proven his glory was secure grendel's head was hauled by the hair dragged across the floor where the people were drinking a horror for both queen and company to behold they stared in awe it was an astonishing sight beowulf son of egtheo spoke so, son of Halfdane, prince of the Shieldings, we are glad to bring this booty from the lake. It is a token of triumph, and we tender it to you. I barely survived the battle under water. It was hard fought, a desperate affair, that could have gone badly if God had not helped me. The outcome would have been quick and fatal. Although hunting is hard-edged, I could never bring it to bear in battle. But the Lord of Men allowed me to behold, for he often helps the unbefriended an ancient sword shining on the wall, a weapon made for giants, there for the wielding. Then my moment came in the combat, and I struck the dwellers in that den. Next thing the Damascen's sword blade melted, it bloated and it burned in their rushing blood. I have wrested the hilt from the enemy's hand, avenged the evil done to the Danes. It is what was due, and this I pledge, O prince of the shieldings, you can sleep secure with your company of troops in Heorot Hall. Never need you fear for a single thane of your sept or nation. Young warriors are old. That lay waste of life that you and your people endured of yore. Then the gold hilt was handed over to the old lord, a relic from long ago for the venerable ruler. That rare smith work was passed on to the prince of Danes when those devils perished. Once death removed that murdering, guilt-steeped, God-cursed fiend, eliminating his unholy life, and his mother as well. It was willed to that king, who of all the lavish gift-lord of the north was beset, regarded between the two seas. Hrothgar spoke. He examined the hilt, that relic of old times. It was engraved all over and showed how war first came into the world, and the flood destroyed the tribes of giants. They suffered a terrible severance from the Lord. The Almighty made the waters rise, drown them in a deluge for retribution, and pure gold inlay on the sword gods. There were rune markings, correctly incised, stating and recording for whom the sword had been first made and ornamented. 
with its scroll work tilt, then every one hushed, as the son of Halfdane spoke his wisdom, a protector of his people, pledged to uphold truth and justice and to respect tradition, is entitled to affirm that this man was born to distinction. Beowulf, my friend, your fame has gone far and wide, you are known everywhere, in all things you are even-tempered, prudent and resolute, so I stand firm by the promise of friendship we exchanged before, forever you will be your people's mainstay and your own warrior's helping hand. Heromod was different, the way he behaved to Egwala's son. His rise to the world brought little joy to the Danish people, only death and destruction. He vented his rage on men he caroused with, killed his own comrades, a pariah king, who cut himself off from his own kind, even though Almighty God had made him eminent and powerful and marked him from the start for a happy life. But a change happened. He grew bloodthirsty, gave no more rings to honor the Danes. He suffered in the end, for having plagued his people for so long, his life lost happiness. So I learned from this and understood true values. I, who tell you, have wintered into wisdom. It is a great wonder how Almighty God in his magnificence favors our race with rank and scope and the gift of wisdom. His sway is wide. Sometimes he allows the mind of a man of distinguished birth to follow its bent, grants him fulfillment and felicity on earth, and forts to command in his own country. He permits him to lord it in many lands, until the man in his unthinkingness forgets that it will ever end for him. He indulges his desires. Illness and old age mean nothing to him. His mind is untroubled by envy or malice or the thought of enemies with their hate-honed swords. The whole world comforts to his will. He is kept from the worst until an element of overweening enters him and takes hold while the soul's guard. Its sentry drowses, grown too distracted. A killer stalks him, an archer who draws a deadly bow, and then the man is hit in the heart. The arrow flies beneath his defenses, the devious promptings of the demon start. His old possessions seem paltry to him now. He covets and resents, dishonors custom and bestows no gold, and because of good things that the heavenly powers gave him in the past, he ignores the shapes of things to come. Then finally the end arrives, when the body he was lent collapses and falls, prey to its death. Ancestral possessions and the goods he hoarded are inherited by others who lets them go with a liberal hand. O oh, flower of warriors, beware of that trap. Choose, dear Beowulf, the better part, eternal rewards. Do not give away to pride. For a brief while your strength is in bloom, but it fades quickly, and soon there will follow illness or the sword to lay you low, or a sudden fire, or a surge of water, or jabbing blade, or javelin from the air or repellent age. Your piercing eye will dim and darken, and death will arrive, dear warrior, to sweep you away. Just so I ruled the Ring Dane's country for fifty years, defended them in wartime with spear and sword against the constant assaults by many tribes. I came to believe my enemies had faded from the face of the earth. Still, what happened was a hard reversal. From bliss to grief, Grendel struck after lying in wait, he laid waste to the land, and from that moment my mind was in dread of his deprivations. So I praise God in his heavenly glory that I live to behold this head dripping blood, and that after such harrowing I can look upon it in triumph at last. Take your place, then, with pride and pleasure, and move to the feast. Tomorrow morning our treasure will be shared and showered upon you. The geat was elated, and gladly obeyed the old man's bidding. He sat on the bench, and soon all was restored, the same as before. Happiness came back, the hall was thronged, and a banquet set forth. Black night fell and covered them in darkness. 